morning and thanks everybody for being here and for uh, trying something a little new today. I am delighted that you are here with us, Deacon Frank. And we, um, as a congregation, are really inspired by uh, the work you do at Operation Night Watch. And we have really embraced making sandwiches once, once a month on Sundays and the sock drive and all sorts of things for Operation Night Watch. And so, as I let you know when I invited you here, we're in the midst of this six week Eastertide series called Signs of Life which has been a gift and a challenge for me to preach because I've been in the midst of uh, losing my stepfather and then the grief around that. But what has emerged for me over these six weeks that I wrote about in our monthly newsletter is that hope in new life doesn't necessarily come after all the devastation and heartbreak is over, but it comes right in the middle of it, right alongside it. And that God is calling us into new life, even in the midst of times that seem very bleak. So when I started thinking about this, you popped into my head. Because I don't know, I'm a big fan of Deacon Frank's social media feed, I have to tell you. <laughs> Your stories are wonderful. And they point to that very thing for me. That they're in the midst of the really uh, challenging and devastating circumstances that you encounter people in your work on the street. You have a gift for finding some shred of love, of hope, of something there for us to hold on to, um, and that keeps us going. So I'm really excited to have you here. I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, and I want to start by asking you about what first drew you to the work of Operation Nightwatch? Thank you, Pastor Jennifer. It's a delight to be back uh, and to see so many of you uh, again uh, and online as well. I don't know where I'm looking back here, uh, but great to see you uh, all the way to the UK. Um, and I'm, I'm struck by um, I'm struck by a few things. Uh, you know, in this uh, Easter season, you know, we're reminded that um, Friday is good because Sunday is coming. And so, the, and Jenny, your, your beautiful reading there holding joy and sorrow in the midst. We know how it ends. It helps us get through the sorrow. My condolences for what you and your family are going through, uh, Jennifer. Um, yeah, so what drew me to the work of Operation Nightwatch, I think, was a, a few things. Uh, I've always felt uh, sensitive to um, how we can isolate ourselves from each other and kind of protect ourselves from each other and kind of want to ignore the person who's suffering because we're maybe doing okay right now and it's it's a little dangerous and vulnerable to allow ourselves to suffer with somebody in in a given moment um but that's where we meet god and so i was always in corporate life we would have these gatherings and all the departments would show up and i recognized immediately that like people from each department would hang out only with people from each department and i was i was always wondering why aren't we crossing over to get to know each other we're better together um, in my early corporate life, I would find myself going to dinners with uh, people, uh, and I would excuse myself from the table because I saw someone on the sidewalk, uh, and I would go hang out with that person for a while, listen to their story. Um, so there was a confluence of things. One time, a, a new executive came in and said, um, Frank, what would you be doing if money wasn't a factor? And it was a moment of truth, and I told my brand new executive, I said, I wouldn't be working here <laughs> a anymore. Um, basically signing my resignation uh, and within the next year I was I was off in pursuit of ministry I think uh, at the essence though Jennifer uh, long way to get to uh, maybe a more succinct answer what drew me to the work of night watch was uh, the essence of a story of old pastor Rick our former ED who talked in great detail about an encounter he had with a lady late at night on a dark street in Seattle she rushed up to him out of the darkness and just asked to hold hands and uh, asked for prayer right now. Pastor, pray for me right now. And he described the grittiness of her hand um, and hearing the sounds of the city behind her. But all that mattered right now was this 15 seconds of encounter and hand holding and uh, the grip with which she was holding on. 
Um, and he described the eternity that he found in that moment of being with another and knowing that Christ was present as we gathered in his name. And then she was gone. And I had a sense at that time that life is a lot about these momentary encounters of putting ourselves out on the streets, figuratively, literally, with the other, uh, who we dare not hold hands with sometime. Um, uh, to, to, yeah, to just be nourished and to find uh, eternity in those little fleeting moments. All my answers won't be as lengthy as that one. <laughs> That was beautiful. I guess I got to hold up the mic. Um, one story that you wrote about recently that really impacted me was a story of a woman who overdosed in line for a meal. Can you tell that story? Yes. Um, so every night at our dinner center, uh, folks can line up about an hour in advance, and it, the line wraps around our building. We're feeding over 150 people a hot meal every night. Um, and there was a little clamor the other night and, uh, at the back of the line, and it gets dark back there at the back of the line, literally, maybe figuratively as well, because you're at the back of the line, you don't know how long it's going to take. Um, and a young lady went down uh, on the sidewalk, and fortunately we had Narcan, um, and we, we got it to her. But what happened was then a, a flurry of activity. 911 was on the scene. And, um, they have limits to what they can do. You know, like all these apparatuses for life saving, but it comes down to the individual person's decision about will they accept it. Um, and they tried their best. <clears throat> she came back too after her moment of overdose, but we know that. The Suboxone, the Narcan that we give, only reverses temporarily the effects of the opiates. And there's a danger that if you're not monitored, you can slip back into an overdose and die an hour later. And so we, we, the 911 said, well, there's nothing we could do, and they walked away. And so a few of us knelt down, and we were just begging and pleading with her, affirming that your life is valuable, despite being back at the end of the line in darkness, Whatever you're going through, whatever you're trying to cope with, uh, you, you're loved and your life has meaning and you're desired, and all this. Uh, alas, you know, lo authentic love is only offered and never imposed. Um, and so she declined uh, all of our offers. Uh, but what happened next was uh, particularly moving, and that is, uh, in the midst of the crowd back there in the line, uh, begging uh, and, and affirming someone's life, several other people took notice. And we forget, we kind of forget how people are watching when we're trying to love as imperfectly and we thought this is a failure. And we planted seeds of proposal to the young lady. Um, but several other people were leaning up against the building in various states of cognition. And they said, wow. Wow, it's really, it's really beautiful to see how you show up back here and just offer love. And I think then these folks started to speak on behalf of a, a very marginalized part of our society that they're saying, we don't hear that out here. Uh, we're often just hanging out in the dark and we're, we're ridiculed, we're ignored, we, are, uh, we have insults hurled at us all day long, get a job. Uh, you're good for nothing. It's like literally, we society can inadvertently participate in cursing one another and widening the chasm. Uh, so all of a sudden, we can call him Mike, and we can call this other guy Aman, and they just started to say, "Wow!" Um, and they said, "Pastor, you're loved." I was like, "No, no, yeah, and you're loved too." And so all around this lady, we found ourselves just reminding each other that there is a source of love and we are loved and we're hugging each other. Um, it, didn't, it didn't perfect everything. We don't know what happened to our young lady friend. Uh, but, but it was beautiful to see how, how God was at work there at the back of the line witnessing. I reflect a lot about that. Yeah. How are we called to, what are the backs of the lines we're supposed to go to? How does Christ keep meeting us when we're at the back of the line in any way in our lives? 
And so this is a little bit more of a personal question about about you and how you do this work because you know, on the face of it, that story does like as you said, it you know, it seems like a failure. She she overdoses, you can't get her to get help, you have no idea where she goes. And yet you have eyes to see what else is happening, right? You didn't stop there. The story doesn't stop there. Um, so do you consider yourself to be a naturally optimistic person? How, what are, what infuses this spirit in you, yeah. Deacon Frank? I've been loved greatly beginning with my grandmother in her kitchen, which is why I stopped in the kitchen. Thank you, ladies. Peggy, that's Peggy's kitchen. Uh, uh, I've been loved. I've just, I've just been tremendously loved, and I feel I'm very secure. And so when I started to learn the faith and walk in the faith traditions, it made sense to me because my parents and family were those first, first images of a loving God for me. Um, and I've been hit on the head enough times to know that, yeah, um, uh, love wins, no matter how much human physical suffering. We didn't have much money, lived very um, rurally, um, but love was this uh, thing that animated our ability to be present with each other. I also was privileged to grow up before smartphones were around, and so uh, our family wasn't distracted by those devices as much as we were making eye contact with each other and giving kisses and hugs and reminders that we're loved. So I think, if anything, uh, I was surrounded by a nurturing environment that, that uh, appealed to that uh, belonging that I've always desired. And I, I think it's made me sensitive to folks who aren't experiencing that yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah. Another story that you um, have shared is the glass slipper story. So will you please share that story? Yeah, I'm going to share it imperfectly because I don't want to read it. Um, but it's, a, it's another young lady who showed up at our evening meal center. And uh, we sometimes get donated items. Um, we're not really a clothing bank or, a, uh, or anything. Um, we're totally no barrier. So people can just show up in whatever state they're in. And she was talking with some folks who we couldn't see. Uh, and um, her, her shoes were enormous and there were no laces on them. And she said, yeah, these are my cousin's size 13 sneakers. I've been traipsing around in them all day. And we know that your feet can get really uncomfortable if you're, if you're not well shorn uh, out there. Um, and so she had all these concerns. I said, well, let's come in and have something to eat and just have a seat. Uh, and take a rest for a little while. That tends to help a lot, and it did for her a great deal. But then we looked to see if we had some shoes, and we had some really cute running shoes that were exactly her size. And I was given a privilege of sitting with her, and in her, in her current capacity, I knew that she would need some help changing the shoes. Um, and so I had the privilege of helping her change her socks, and a friend of mine showed up with a brand new pair of socks. So, those 40,000 pair of socks that you guys are a big part of, we have the privilege of doing like this modern day foot washing of being with the person in a moment. It's, it's quite a privilege. I say that just so you know that, boy, they make a difference. Every sandwich, every pair of socks. Uh, and so while she's kind of eating her food and she's not totally hungry, but she's kind of famished in another way, her body is kind of fighting off the food because of what might be coursing through her veins right now. Um, She's very aware that I'm changing her shoes and she gets her new clean socks on and we put the shoes on and she looks at them and does this thing where she like holds them up and she's like so thankful that now there's a pair of shoes that fit. I call it the glass slipper story because, oh, these ones are, are made for me almost. And then she pushes her food aside, she stands up and she starts to do like this little movement where she like moves around and she just delights that her feet now have sort of a firm foundation, but now there's comfort and she can kind of go anywhere. And I was, in my story, I was thinking about a, when, when we're kids and we're taking back to school shopping, we get our new sneaks, right? Or maybe we're going to a fancy ball or something. She just delighted. Uh, and that was one of those moments, sort of like the hand-holding moment uh, that I described earlier, 
that she was just delighting in having been seen, and there were so many other things we couldn't do for her. Um, but it kind of reminds me of those, like, offer a glass of water, offer a sandwich, Matthew 25, you visited me when I was sick, you, you gave me some clothing when I needed clothing. Uh, there's a real way of encounter that's happening uh, beyond, you know, just a size seven pair of Nike shoes. And then she was gone. And then she was gone. We don't know if we'll see her again, uh, but we hold her in our prayer and hoping that maybe it's like a little seed that was planted. We see you, we love you, you're desired. So one thing that strikes me in, in reading about your work and, ha and you know, talk, having talked to you about it is that, you know, we are, we're in this environment now where we hear about the decline in churches and we hear about, you know, people in the Northwest aren't interested in churches and it's the most unchurched place in the country, yada, yada. But a lot of what you experience are people who are very much hungering for God, for prayer, for connection, um, for a sense that they are beloved children of God. So um, can you talk about that, kind of that, that disconnect or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, I have two quick stories. Uh, one is, is uh, I think, a, a failure that God allowed me to experience, um, at least in the short term. We can call him Casper. Um, and he famously said to me, hey, wh what church do you go to? Because I'm going to go to that church. I said, well, you're Casper, there's a lot of churches around here. No, 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 no. What's your church? Because your church is the one that sent you out here. And so you're, the people at your church love me, but just by nature of why you're here, I want to go to your church. And my brothers and sisters, I probably made the worst comment afterward because I, I flash forwarded and I looked at the wrong part of our population at the church who wouldn't welcome Casper, who I knew wasn't, weren't ready to welcome Casper. And I revealed that to Casper. Uh, and I tried to back up and say, Casper, you're worthy to be welcomed. You are truly worthy to be welcomed everywhere. Truly. My concern is, <laughs> and my brothers and sisters, this is something really huge on my heart that we have to keep praying for. That a lot of folks in our faith tradition have said equivalently, uh, and it's from Matthew 25, it's sort of a paraphrase, unless we recognize Christ in the beggar at the door, we won't authentically recognize Christ in our worship. And I think about Casper a lot because Casper has a hunger. To look at Casper, no shirt, unkempt hair, dirty, uh, living amidst trash on the streets, probably having to sell himself to survive. Um, and in a mysterious way, that's Jesus, fully incarnate, participating in all of the struggles of humanity, and we consider him an outcast. And his biggest desire when we get to listen to him is he wants to, he wants to sing these hymns with us and reflect on how we hold joy and sorrow simultaneously. And he just wants to be welcomed. And I preached about Casper. And I, I confessed to my congregation the, the biggest mistake I made. And afterward, I had this many people say, I'd be happy to go get Casper and sit with him. I'm like, oh. But I had this many people who, I think we, a lot of us, we've become victims of this polarized society where we become afraid of one another. And um, we forget that Jesus invites us to participate in what a lot of people in the ecumenical movement call, we forget to participate in Jesus' incarnational movement, that when we were far off, Jesus dared to come to us humbly, in poverty, vulnerably. Um, that's what's on my heart a lot. But to, hear, to know of Casper's hunger, and I said it was a quick story, sorry. The, the, the second one really is quick. I think about, Cas there's a lot of Caspers. Uh, the more encouraging one lately, a young mother and her son approached us. We were doing a community dinner in North Seattle in a parking lot where we just show up and feed people and get to know them. We proclaim a little bit of scripture, hear prayer requests, or talk about the Mariners, whatever people want. And a lady saw our free prayer sign and she approached with her young son 
and kind of stood off at a distance and just kind of pointed and said, can we have some? And we thought she wanted food. We said, yeah, we got it's casserole tonight. Come on over. No, this, uh, we don't know how to pray. Uh, my other son died three years ago. He had wanted to become Christian. We never got around to it. We regret it. We're looking for peace. We need to know if he's okay. Um, but we don't know how to pray. We happen to um, not have a church community. And she was thrilled to just see us in a parking lot. And so, again, to the hunger part, a young woman and her son approached. And we had this privilege of proclaiming good news for all of that ails her and, and you know, invoking the name of Jesus who loves her. And uh, a moment, it was sort of a handhold moment of peace. Uh, there's a lot of hunger. And it's, um, it's on the streets of Seattle. Uh, it's in our neighborhoods. It's in parking lots. I think sometimes we're just called to like stand someplace that might be uncomfortable with us and see how God wants to show up and encourage. It really, it's, it's an encouragement um, to listen to the hunger. To listen to the hunger. What's the most exciting part of your work? And what do you love? And what sustains you? Yeah. Uh, the most exciting part um, is seeing the unexpected ways that God is talking. Um, surprisingly, sometimes that's a moment of solidarity with someone who's excluded. Um, I've been pushed out of churches physically, even while exiting quietly speaking with someone after a moment, after an hour of worship. Um, and this is the polarization again. Um, consider a whole community gathered in worship. This is great. It's the beginning and ending part of our week. And I'm visiting with someone in a very friendly way, quietly. And I feel a forceful hand on my back saying, you have to leave. Some of us are trying to pray in here. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I can, I can do that. But it's kind of like a moment of solidarity with the Casper mm -hmm. who's being excluded or not welcomed. And um, that's as clergy in my own tradition <laughs> after our you know, culminating hour of worship for the week. Um, and I can do that as well. I can exclude. So the privilege of getting to experience the solidarity, but again, um, all these stories we've talked about, the glass slipper, the end of the line, the reminder of how good it feels to, to know that we're loved. Um, I, I delight in seeing how God wants to surprise and awaken me. Yeah. I'm just going to say amen to that. That's beautiful. Thanks for being here. Thanks for this conversation. Thanks for really illuminating for us the signs of life that are out there on the streets among people who um, we don't hear about very much yeah. and we often uh, don't think about enough. So yeah. thanks so much. <laughs>